In today's video, we're gonna talk about what is wholesaling. We're gonna talk about how it works and what you need to do to learn how to wholesale real estate for yourself. Now, in this video, it is actually me being interviewed on one of my local mastermind groups. Now, I'm in several mastermind groups. Some of them, these groups are big national groups that maybe meet quarterly or even annually. Others are local, right? So I'm in a local mastermind. And in this group, my good, or in this video, my good buddy, Jim, at our three doors, local mastermind here in St. Louis, interviews me and I explain what wholesaling is, how it works, how we're able to do so many deals, and what you can do to do the same thing. Now, from recording this, it's probably been about a week and a half to two weeks, and I've gotten a lot of feedback, and that's why I'm sharing it with you guys today. And most of the feedback was about the mindset. It wasn't even about wholesaling or how we're doing it or what we're doing, but it was about the mindset. So I want you guys to take this video in and understand what wholesaling is, how it works, and really big picture what is happening behind the scenes. I hope you guys get a ton of value from this video. I know you will. I did. And thank you for watching. Let's do it. If you don't have any money or anything to bring to the table, then ask them what you can do. I have investments and assets that pay me enough money that it covers all of my expenses. Network, network, network. Okay, so we have Dave Dodge here. Uh, so Dave, uh, you have been investing now for, is it right around five years? Is that right? Uh, so full time, it's been five years. I've been investing in real estate uh, for about 15, going on 16 years, but I've been doing it full time for five. Okay. So full time for five and you've been hovering the last couple of years around a hundred deals, I think of which how many are flips, how many are wholesales? How, how's that work? Um, so we're basically, we're buying a hundred houses a year. Um, I think we did 98 and 18 and 92 and 19. Um, we're on pace this year to probably do 80 or 90 as well. So not, not quite a hundred, but we're, we're right up there. Um, typically we are buying, um, and doing all of our marketing, for our own portfolio. I mean, we're looking for our own deals to buy and add as rental properties. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you great, yeah. Um, or we're buying to flip, right? So we have kind of an internal motto here, and I have two partners, Mike Slane and Bill Merritt, and our motto is keep the best, sell the rest. So what ends up happening is we do um, a lot of marketing to generate leads, and the leads in the marketing that we do, we market in areas that we really want to buy. So some of the types of marketing that I'm doing right now is radio advertising, which um, doesn't really fit in what I'm talking about because it's just broadcasted everywhere. Um, so we do do a lot of, or a little bit, I should say, of just general marketing. Uh, but then from there, we do uh, direct mail, cold calling, and cold texting. We focus those types of campaigns in areas that we want to buy and own property. So again, we're buying the best, we're selling the rest. Now, sometimes we'll stumble across a lead um, from that marketing that's not in an area that we may buy in wholesale. Um, and then of course, the leads that come in from the radio are just kind of everywhere. So we do a lot of marketing, but most of it, for the most part, most of it is specific to where we want to do our investing. Um, when those leads come in, again, we buy the best and we sell the rest. So Typically, um, in a perfect world, it'd be about 33, 33, 33, a third. Uh, but it kind of swings from time to time, depending on how many projects we have going or if we're on a buying spree for our own rental portfolio or need a couple rehabs. But in a perfect world, we try to basically um, buy two of the three that come in and either flip ourselves or add to our portfolio. And then a 33% roughly share of, you know, the leads that come in, uh, we end up wholesaling off. So that's kind of what we do in terms of, um, you know, what the, what we do with the leads that come in, let's say. So, so this is fascinating guys, because let's dive into this one little saying here and let's expand up on it a little bit. So buy the best. Um, so as far as just the buy the best part of it, uh, what exact, so, 
So when you have your criteria and Dave Dodge, Jim Manning. Uh, Jim, you got any headphones, buddy? Uh, is the audio not that good? Let me stand up. Yeah, it's, it's just echoing real bad. Um, but it's all good. No big deal. So, so again, this is the first time I've used this room to record. Uh, thanks in advance for the audio. No worries. After You're good. good. I, um, uh, I was telling everybody I have this nice mic and I forgot the cord. So <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Yeah. Uh, so thanks in advance for uh, uh, you know, the echoing of the audio. I'll, I'll fix that for next time. You're good. So, so by the best. So, so let's break this down really quick because... Uh, I'm going to make an argument or a, a point that uh, Dave Dodge, what's best for him, and Jim Manning was best for me, and um, Ryan Wessels at Bob DeClue, any of the other investors that are seasoned, um, we identify when we're seasoned, we've identified exactly what the best is to us. And uh, Dave might be, the, what's best to him might be actually a little bit different than what's best for another seasoned investor because uh, it's exactly the, the exact buy box, the exact buying criteria. So, um, so it doesn't necessarily mean just because Dave wants to wholesale a deal that it's not necessarily the best deal for you. It's exactly what you're looking for. It might not just be exactly what's best for, uh, for Dodge. Um, so what is the best for you specifically, Dave? Um, like so that's a great question because it varies too from time to time. So you know, best has a lot of meanings to me, right? So best could mean, hey, this is a really, really good deal for me to rehab and, and, and retail and make a profit on. It could mean, hey, this is a deal that I'm going to be able to burr and add to my rental uh, portfolio with uh, little to none money, little to no money, you know, invested in the end or sometimes even be able to walk and have a lot of equity in that property. Or best could be, hey, instead of, you know, trying to make 30 or 35 grand on a flip, we can make 15 and we can get paid in a week. So, you know, all of these are great problems to have. And best really just determines on, you know, hey, how's the cash flow looking right now? What upcoming expenses do we have? How many projects are already in the queue for um, the rental portfolio? You know, we, we, in order for us to do what we do with, with rentals, we, we rehab every one of them. Um, and we use the burst strategy and we get loans based on the appraisal. So we leave little to no money in them. Um, but the coolest part about it is, is we get a house basically for free and it's rehabbed and rented. You know, getting a free house is one thing, but getting one that's producing and it doesn't need a ton of updates, you know, within the immediate future because we did them already. That's the coolest part. So best doesn't necessarily mean um, that it's going to make a great rehab or a great rental or a great wholesale. Best to me means, hey, what's best for my business right now? So when I say keep the best, sell the rest, you know, we may sell off a crazy good deal, but it's best for my business to maybe make that 15 or 20 grand today to help pay some bills next week, then have 40 or 50 grand in equity in a rental that I may not see that cash for, you know, five to 10 years. So it kind of varies. Um, so, so it's not necessarily best in terms of the property itself. That's, I'm really glad, glad that you asked this question. Yeah. It's really, hey, what is the best for my business right now, right? So as a real estate investor, we're in the marketing business uh, more so than we are in the real estate business. And some people may disagree with me on that, but the more deals that you start doing, the more you'll start to understand that. And that was the biggest epiphany that, that I learned um, when I first started and I struggled for about three and a half months to do a deal, I hired a coach and he said, David, you're not in the real estate business, even though you think you are a real estate investor, uh, you're in the marketing business. And like two weeks later, I started doing deals, right? I was like, all right, you know, screw it. You're right. You know, I could drive around and look at houses all day, but unless I'm making offers, I'm not going to buy any of them, right? So how do you make offers? Well, you get people that are motivated to either call you or you call them. And you start making offers. That's it. That's the whole name of the game. So wholesaling to me is a means to an end, right? It is a job. And I like to automate things in my life. I like to leverage other people. I like to leverage systems. So, you know, wholesaling definitely isn't something that I wake up every morning and I say, let's go wholesale a deal. Instead, I wake up every morning and I say, hey, let's do some marketing. Let's generate some leads. And if we get a deal that makes a great wholesale, boom, we're going to wholesale it. But if it also makes a good rental or if it makes a great flip, then that's really where the marketing uh, becomes more of investing, right? So you become an investor, in my opinion, when you start taking risk, but you can eliminate a lot of risk by wholesaling, right? So 
a lot of little things that are in there, but to me, wholesaling is a job. It's a means to an end. Uh, my passion is rental properties and passive income. It's really, really what I like to do. We have a lot of fun uh, fix and doing rehabs and retailing, you know, fix and flips. Uh, and Bill, my, my partner, Bill, he, he basically kind of handles that branch of the business. Uh, but I like doing it too. You know, I tag along a lot on appointments and, um, and just help. I have a couple students right now that I'm, that I'm partnering with. I joint venture with people to do flips. And a lot of it's just kind of building their confidence. You know, it's like, you know, once you do this 10 times, it's not any different than doing it 2000 times. Yeah. You may learn a couple more things, but really at the end of the day, it's just math, right? You got to remove the emotion from real estate and just look at the numbers and look at your best case, look at your worst case and be prepared for both, right? So yes. um, a lot of it is just confidence. And in fact, somebody messaged me on social media yesterday, I can't remember what platform, and they said, what, is the, what was the biggest hurdle for you in the beginning? And I thought about it and I was like, man, this is a no brainer. Like, why am I contemplating on this? And that, and that biggest hurdle was spending money on marketing. That was what the hardest thing for me to do in the beginning was to just say, okay, this isn't a, an expense. It's an investment. And I need to go spend one or two or $3,000 on marketing. I think my very first campaign, Jim, uh, I spent 1400 or 1600 bucks. I was $62,000 in credit card debt. Um, and I hired a coach too. So I spent uh, like four or five grand on the coach. I spent 1600 on the marketing campaign, which was basically just vacants um, in St. Louis. It's five years ago. And I sent a bunch of postcards out. And, you know, the way I looked at it is going from 62 grand to, you know, 67, 68,000 in debt doesn't even really affect me that much. Like I'm in a bunch of debt. I'm, you know, this, su this sucks in this situation. So let's do something to make it better. Like let's, let's make an investment. And that was the biggest hurdle. The first three and a half months that I tried, I was just cold calling people, just me by myself. Right. And I was only doing it for an hour or two a day, which, you know, that's, that's fine. That'll get you a deal in two months. But unless you want to get a deal from cold calling, you need to either have a dialer, which I didn't have, or you need to be putting in, you know, four or five hours a day doing it. Um, the, the flip side of that is you can pay for marketing to get your message in front of other people so they call you. And, you know, as you get better at this business and you start doing deals, you need to make sure that you are allocating money to your marketing budget because it makes it easier. I mean, think about it. If you have to call, you know, 3,000 people to get, you know, 10 leads to do one deal versus spend $1,500 to get 10 leads to come in to do one deal, you're answering a phone 10 times versus dialing out 3000. I mean, it's just, it's all, I'm all about efficiency, right? So you have to spend money to generate those leads, but it's not a cost. It is an investment. And at this point, you know, we've scaled back. We used to spend 12 to 15 grand a month for about 18 months to two years straight. I think we've scaled back over the last four or five months to probably more along the lines of uh, six to 8,000 a month. But that also includes uh, two full-time virtual assistants um, that I pay five and $8 an hour to. And, um, they help a ton with a lot of those efforts, answering the phones. Uh, one of them does cold calling, you know, about 50% of the time. The other works, the, uh, the texting platform that we have. Um, and we just kind of do, so we're always doing marketing. We're always doing outbound texting, outbound cold calling. Um, and then of course the radio, but occasionally we'll do mail campaigns too. Um, so we're always doing marketing, but again, wholesaling is a, it, it is a job. Um, I've automated it as much as I possibly can at this point and have, you know, people in roles like acquisitions and dispositions and so on and so forth to kind of let me work more on the business than in the business, but I still work in the business cause I enjoy it oddly enough. So like this morning I went on an appointment, uh, down in South County, looked at a property, uh, got pictures and then I just send those over to my team. And then from there, you know, they're going to, they're going to basically do the analysis and make the offer. And if we get it accepted, that's, that's when I'll turn around and look at it again at this point. So okay. I love systems. I love leverage. Um, and it allows us to do more deals. So like the other day when you were on the call and you were saying that, that Kenton, I'm going to call Kenton now, but it's in a good way, buddy. I hope you're listening. Uh, had done 50 deals. I'm like, well, shit, man, he's doing three times as many deals as I am. Right. But not necessarily because, you know, I've leveraged a team around me. So it just kind of depends on what you're wanting to do. I personally don't do that many deals, although I am the one signing on the, the dotted line to be the buyer or the seller. And I'm coordinated. I'm kind of like the quarterback at this point. Um, and it allows us to it allows me to have more time 
you know, I'm not focused on all that little so, stuff so all the time. Go, what, so, so you're going over a tremendous amount of stuff. Let me slow you down. <laughs> That's fine. Go ahead. Um, okay. So there's a lot that he said here, guys. So let's slow it down just a little bit. So when you say I still I got a lot of coffee in me today, uh, are you systematized to the point where you're really just going out on the, the appointment and that's the piece that you like and negotiate? So not even, I mean, really like what I like to do is I like to, um, I like to go on appointments, but for one of two reasons, one, cause I want to, I want, you know, I truly believe in, you know, being a leader, not a boss. So if somebody on my team can't make it, I'm there. Call me, boom, I'm going to go on that appointment, right? So I always want to help any way that I can, right? Number two, I do enjoy it. Now, with that being said, I'm not like, hey, go line Dave up with like 10 appointments this week, right? But if you need me to fill in for two or three here randomly, boom, I'm, I'm down. I enjoy doing it. Uh, but again, I enjoy doing a couple, right? I'm not trying to line up five a day every single day. Um, now one of my, or my main acquisition guy, Travis Wakefield, incredible guy. I love Travis. He lives in Farmington guys. He lives an hour. I don't even know. Is it an hour and a half hour and 10 minutes South? He only comes up maybe once a week. He hasn't even come up in like the last two or three weeks because he hasn't really need needed to. So, you know, he works those phones along with my virtual assistant generates those leads. And if he needs somebody to run out and take pictures, it's like, dude, don't drive an hour up. Like I'm, you know, 20 minutes away from most properties here. Like I'll just run over and get pictures and it gets me out of the house. I get to talk to people and, and, you know, so on and so forth. So, so, so are you, so to walk me through your sales process. So is Travis doing most of the sales virtually then, or is he, is he going? Um, wow. Yeah. I mean, so, so we use, we use Podio for our CRM and REI black book uh, for dispositions. And in Podio, you know, we've built it out and spent, um, I'm going to sneeze, excuse me, guys. Spent a lot of time and money building it out. So it generates offer contracts with about 10 or 12 clicks. So we can, we can generate an offer in about 30 seconds and have it emailed to a seller with right signature. Um, it's not even signed by us. It's actually just a signature, like font. Um, and we close deals with this contract every day. Right. So like, don't tell that my title company, but like, I don't even sign the purchase agreement. It's just, it's ink from a printer. Right. So they, they send it out on my behalf. I'm CC'd. So I see what's going on and I do it too. It's not just them. Um, but then, you know, if this, if the title company does require the signature, I'll just sign next to the, to the. Okay. Ink. So, okay. So you generate the lead. Okay. And then Travis gets on the phone and talks to him. The button creates the podium. Yeah, Travis, one of the two virtual assistants, myself, Mike, maybe Bill, if it's a good rehab opportunity, or um, or Laura, even too. Laura's my disposition girl, and she's great as well. Okay, so it like, does work some leads from time so, so you negotiate the deal completely virtually on the phone, and then you say that again. Do you send the offer before you go out to the property or do you? It depends. I mean, typically we don't want to waste a bunch of time. So we'll just give them a spread. We'll just say, listen, we're investors. We don't pay retail. We have three points of value here as is cash and quick. That's it. I mean, that's all we are doing. We are as investors, we are providing liquidity to the marketplace, especially wholesalers, right? Like let's look at the big picture. What does a wholesaler do? Well, he provides liquidity to a marketplace that doesn't typically have very good liquidity, right? How long does it take, Jim? Let's have a conversation for a second. How long does it take to sell a house typically after you rehab it? Like to get paid? Uh, yeah, I mean, it can very well take, I mean, let's say best case scenario, it sells on the market day one, it can still take 30, 45 days, but it's not okay. Perfect. And if it takes 30 to 45 days to sell, to close, it's another 30, 45 days, right? So again, I'm not, it, there's no right or wrong answer here. It takes a lot of time, right? Yeah, and that's well, the wholesalers case. come along. They say, "Hey, we'll buy your house in two weeks," and we do. You know, we've closed on houses in four days before, right? But if we're going to offer a level of convenience, we got to get a discount, right? That's the name of my brand, Discount Property Investor. I've got to give Mike Mike Slane credit. He coined it. I think it's incredible because that's what we do. And I tell this to sellers all the time. I'm overly transparent. I say, "Hi, I'm David Dodge. I don't pay retail, but I would love to buy your house. If you need a level of convenience that is ultra high, guess what? I have it." as well as cash and I'll buy it as is and we'll do it quick. That's the convenience that I offer. But I'm not gonna offer that to you just because I'm just such a nice person, right? 
I need to get a discount. This has to be the win-win scenario. So that's it. We offer to buy properties at a discount and in return, we give them a level of convenience that is unmatched. They're not going to be able to get that via an agent or elsewhere. And that's the, that is the pitch, right? If they say, oh, I'm not looking to sell at a discount, good buy, right? Virtual assistant, put them on a follow-up drip, call them every two or three months or even every year. I don't want to talk to that person again until they need my level of convenience, right? So you have to understand a couple of simple things. You are in the liquidity business and you are trading convenience for a discount. That's the highest level that you can get, right? Now, you do that by solving their problem and you have to make it a win-win scenario. And at the end of the day, it's, it is a job though, right? Wholesaling. So, you know, take the wholesaling hat off and put the investor hat on by cherry picking the best ones. And again, best is relative to your own business and metrics within, you know, what your goals are and how you plan to reach those goals, right? Um, so it's not just like best, like it's a good location or a good rental, like best is what are your needs now and what are your goals and let's work out the strategy to get there, right? Um, so yeah, you, we're in the liquidity business, we're in the marketing business ultimately. And we trade convenience for a discount and it's really that simple, right? People get ahead of themselves a lot, especially new students that come on and they say, man, you just know so much about this. And I'm like, you know what? I failed a million times, but at the end of the day, all I really look for is, can, is, is motivation and a problem, right? How can I solve this person's problem and do they have enough motivation that, that they need, not want, but need a high level of convenience? If they don't need a high level of convenience, Jim, then they're not going to be willing to sell it to me at a discount. And therefore, I have no interest in wasting my time on that. Now, I'm not saying I won't take the call and be nice and give them advice and maybe even offer to list it because we do have a brokerage here as well. But that's like not my pitch. Like I don't try to point people towards brokerage listings. I want to buy, I want to build my portfolio. I want to fix and flip, you know? So if that's the, what the only option for them is, then of course, Hey, we'll do it at a discount or we'll hook you up or whatever it is just so we can get a little bit more revenue. But our model and our business is buying to build a portfolio of rentals. I think as of today, we have 61 or 62. We just sold a couple off. We got another one closing Friday. Um, so we are selling some of them turnkey right now, but it's only because the market is so hot. Um, we're not really trying to downsize our portfolio, but we are doing what, what some would consider, you know, some rebalancing. We're getting rid of some of the ones that we don't really, you know, want necessarily buying some new ones. We're also paying off some debt. So it's, it's okay, so, actually going. So let's circle back real quick. Okay. So Lee comes in. Do you have, you have one of your VAs? Are you sending them to a voicemail recording or is one of your VAs like picking up and, yeah, so I have um, all of the inbound calls from nine to six are answered live. We don't have a call service. We used to have a call service. At this point, we just let them leave a message or if they call and don't leave a message, they just get called back at 9.01 a.m. the very next morning and we keep calling them until we reach them. Uh, we've had services in the past. Yeah, it may it may be good to have those services because you know, you can jump on those leads a little quicker, but the way we look at it, you know, is like, we don't like competing with other people necessarily. So it's like, if they're, you know, in that much of a hurry, you know, it's probably going to get bit up anyway. If they can't wait till 9 a.m. the next morning, you know, so what? So move on. So, okay, cool. so we don't, we don't have a call service and we have one virtual assistant. He's in the Philippines. He does work our, our time, time zones essentially. So he works 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, Monday through Friday. And all the inbound leads go to him. He, he's my lead. I guess you'd call him my, uh, my lead manager. Okay, so he picks up the phone and he's really just doing the initial screen trying to find for motivation. Um, yeah, his job, is, his job is very simple. You know, hey, thanks for calling House Sold Easy. We're a St. Louis home buyer. We'd love to buy your house. What is your name? What's your address? What's a good number to reach you back at? And how'd you get our information? That's basically what we start with so we can track our metrics. And then last but not least, you know, why are you calling? Tell me about your house. Tell me about your situation. What can we do to help you? Uh, by the way, we're investors. We don't pay retail. We just want to make that very, very clear to you. However, 
Uh, it sounds like you may be having a problem, and guess what? We're expert problem solvers, so let's 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 talk about this. And that's it. That's the pitch. It's so incredibly simple. We don't use call scripts. We don't use anything along those lines. We just make a friend. All right. We don't want our conversations on the phone to sound scripted. We don't want them to think that you know we're trying to lead them down some path um, of resistance or or whatnot. Right. We we are. Hey, you know we are here to help. Maybe we can't help you. Right. Maybe our offer won't work for you, but you know, if you need a high level of convenience, you know, there, AKA you have some motivation, guess what? We helped 98 people last year. I, I'm pretty sure we can help you too. And that's it. We start with the problem and we just try to work our way backwards to, to buying a house from it. Okay. So then, so then he, is he then moving it along your VIP? Get yeah. The- so he'll take down the general information and, and oh. basically let, and then once it comes in, uh, once, so he creates a lead, um, and then that lead automatically tags um, my team and myself to review, and then from there we'll distribute it. So certain people like certain parts of town on my team, like certain people like North North County, others like North South City, others like West County. So depending on where that lead comes in, you know somebody will pick it, pick or choose to work it, or we'll even assign it to somebody, and then from there it's their job to call that person back and set an appointment. The original person that that's taking the calls, they don't set any appointments. They, they just keep it simple. They try to make a friend and let them know that, you know, this is a business to us. Yes. But at the same time, like we, we, we do care. We, we do want to work with them and see what we can do to, to help them with their problem. And if there's a level of motivation that's there, then we'll call them back right away. Somebody on the team and set it up an appointment or talk further. And if the level of motivation isn't that high, then we may not even call them back right away. We may wait a week or a month, you know, just because it's like, we're not in a big hurry to offer a bunch of convenience to somebody that doesn't want to sell a discount again. That's the trade-off, guys. Don't forget that. You know, you are trading convenience for a discount. If somebody isn't willing to provide you a big discount on a property, why would you continue to try to offer them a crazy amount of convenience? Like this blows my mind when a lot of investors get in the game. And I get it if you're just like chasing deals and wanting to do deals. But a couple of years ago, I decided, hey, I'm gonna quit chasing deals, right? Yeah, I'm going to follow up. That's not what I said. I didn't say I'm going to stop following up. I said, I'm going to quit chasing deals, right? And my life got a whole hell of a lot easier because I basically just lead with, I'm an investor. I don't pay retail. However, I would love to buy it. So hey, if you want my level of convenience, um, then you have to give me a discount or else I'm going to take this level of convenience, which is just money. And I'm going to go find somebody else that does need that level of convenience and i'm gonna make or you know hopefully let them you know sell me the deal at a discount and then a win-win will be created so let me add to this guys so like listen to his mindset on it you can do that and you can get to that if you ha- if you know you're going to get another 10 leads tomorrow you know you're going to get another 10 leads the rest of the week or whatever his lead volume is if your activity level, it's a numbers game. If your activity levels to where, oh, you're just gonna once an hour a week do some cold calls, that's the lead gen, uh, generation strategy that you pick. When you get that lead come in, that comes in, whether they're motivated or not, you're gonna chase after it because like you kind of have to at that point because you put yourself in a position that you really don't have options because you haven't done enough lead generation uh, to be able to get into that mindset. 100%. Hundred percent, but that has repercussions too, though, because if you're calling somebody every three days and they don't answer for ten times, so you you know that's thirty days have gone by calling ten times, and they finally answer on that thirty third day, that's the eleventh phone call. You know they to, and you put yourself in their shoes. They're like, man, this guy really wants to buy my house. Like, I'm gonna get as much as I possibly can. Well, if I call somebody, you know, let's say every other week, and then maybe a month goes by when we don't, and then we call them. You know, they're like, okay, yeah, I mean, I've been kind of ducking this guy. I've been busy. Let's finally meet. Or if they just call us back, boom, that's where the motivation comes in. So we stop chasing um, just because it helps eliminate the tire kickers. It helps eliminate the non-motivated people. Um, But the thing about motivation is it comes in in waves, not for us on, on this call, but for our motivated sellers. They may not be motivated today, but they'll be motivated on Tuesday because they had a bad day at work. So you definitely want to have a high amount of engagement in, in um, I guess engagement is the right word, you know, with your motivated sellers. 
So there's a difference between not chasing and not following up. And again, I'm not saying don't follow up. We have an amazing follow-up system. It's, we use humans, they call, they text, they email. We don't, do, we don't have a ton of automation. We just do it the old fashioned way. Um, but we make sure that they know that when they are ready for that level of convenience, we would love to talk numbers with them. So one of the biggest mistakes I made when I was starting out was I would get that lead and then if they didn't accept the offer, I'd move on to the next one. And I didn't follow up at all. Uh, if you do your follow up right, uh, industry standards are 70 to 80% of your deals should come from over 30 days of follow up. Uh, what do you know? Do you have your numbers dialed in? Do you know? What yeah, I mean, I don't know exactly, but it takes us four to six months to close a deal from initial contact on average. And beginning four to, four to six are, months, guys. So, yeah. so we know we're, we're probably doing a little less than we normally do. We usually average eight to 10. I'd say the last two, three months, we're probably more like six or eight just because of the situation with the economy and COVID and all that bullshit. But um, it's, you know, six or four to six months for it to close. So that's on average. So that's five years worth of data too, right? So do we get a call today sometimes or, you know, on a day and then have an appointment later that day or the next day, get it under contract that day or the next day and have it sold the next day all the time, right? But there's also people that we mailed four and a half years ago that were finally, their, their motivation is finally at the level where they're willing to, and you guys are going to get tired of me saying this, but you need to hear it it's going to get to the point where their level of motivation was high enough that they were willing to trade their property at a discount for my convenience. It's so incredibly simple. So when you average five years of data, it's about four to six months on average um, to do a deal. And I think that that's going to basically be pretty consistent over the next five years too, right? Um, sometimes they go quick. Sometimes you have to keep following up with these people. Um, yeah, so, one of the hardest things when you're starting out is getting over that hump, realizing that uh, if you're doing everything right, your business and the income you can make really isn't really going to start till months four through six as you have some of those follow-ups that are, that are coming through um, and getting over that hump. Because, yeah, I mean, only a certain percentage of them, it's, um, you know, 10 to 30 percent, depending on how you're running your business, are going to be within that first 30 days uh, from the lead. So... Okay, so let's go. Hey, let's go back to your uh, sales process because this is this is amazing. I just had a just so you know, I just had a chat come in uh, that said this is an awesome call with like three exclamation points. Brian, Sweet. I hope Brian, you guys are learning something. Uh, 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 so hey, so dude, so okay, so lead comes in initial uh, initial. So I call it an inside sales agent ISA that takes the initial call. So so ISA, uh, you call them lead manager, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter. Uh, takes the phone call, filters the lead, it creates, creates information on them. You send the lead over to the team and then the team decides, okay, this is a best lead for the North County investor on your team. Okay. It's, yeah, essentially. So basically the, the, yeah, the ISA, they take the information, they, they try to build rapport. Like that's kind of the main thing that they do. They just like, they, they are the, they are the first contact with my company. So if these initial calls last 20 or 30 minutes, that's completely fine with me. Um, I want them to know that we are here to help and that we buy a lot of houses and that we have rentals. Um, and I want them to try to make a friend, just get as much information as possible. But they also, you know, make themselves very clear that like they are the lead manager and, you know, um, that they will connect us or they, that they will connect that seller, you know, with one of the buyers on the team, but they don't want to waste their time. Right. So they want to make sure that we can help them. Um, and then they, yeah, they enter it into Podio, uh, which is a CRM. And then it automatically, when the lead's created via, you know, some automations we have set up, it just tags and, and notifies everybody on the team. And then that virtual assistant or ISA then goes in and runs comps for us, pulls an ARV. Uh, they pull like a screenshot of the comps. They pull an AVM. They pull a Zestimate. Just basic general data that we can kind of use on the fly. Um, to analyze that property. I don't spend a ton of time analyzing properties uh, prior to seeing them. Honestly, I'll look at those, those simple numbers like a Zestimate, an AVM. Um, PropStream has an estimate as well that we use Redfin. I mean, we'll pull a couple of those and we'll just kind of average it and we'll just start there. And then once that we see that there's level of motivation, then we'll do a little bit more of a deep dive to determine those ARVs or the values of those properties. But from the hip, it's like, you know, if they're not willing to sell it at 70 to 80 cents on the dollar 
um, again, their motivation isn't high enough. They're not willing to trade it for a discount. Therefore, why should I give them a level of Okay, so, so VA does the initial comp and your comp range is, let's say it's 100,000 to 120,000 on what the resale ARV, the after repair value would be. Uh, so then, and it's, he assigns it to you, Dave. So then you pick up the phone call and you set an appointment or you're actually call and then you kind of do you go I mean, them. both. I mean, if, if they're hot and they're motivated, the, the ISA will set the appointment. I mean, they're obviously trained to do that. And they'll just call me and say, hey, Dave, are you available now? I'll go there, right? Or can you meet Tuesday at six or whatever? Like, they're, they will set the appointment. But typically, if they're not super motivated and they need to sell it or it's not on fire as we speak, they'll just tag me in it along with my team. We'll kind of analyze it and we'll say, all right, who would be the best to work with these sellers? Now, um, you know, we have... Um, we have a, a very diverse set of people in St. Louis, right? Like we have a Bosnian population. Um, we have, you know, white people, we have African American people, we have Asian people, we have different type of people. So certain people on my team work better with certain people, right? So like if it's in an area of town that is, you know, highly concentrated with a certain type of person, we may have somebody on the team that works really well with those people. So it wouldn't make sense for me to go there whenever somebody else might be able to do it better, right? So we don't really have territories for our buyers. It's really just like, hey, what's your level of expertise? Who do you work well with? When those type of leads come in, we're gonna give them to you, right? Um, so yeah, they generate the lead, we then review. From there, we'll either call the person up just as a second call, just to kind of introduce ourselves, And again, kind of re-engage them as well as determine that level of motivation. If an appointment needs to be set, we'll set one. Um, Again, if they're not really motivated, I don't want to waste time going there. However, the catch 22 on this is, you know, I said this earlier, levels of motivation with sellers, they change and they change very rapidly. So it is a good idea to get out and meet these people, build a little bit of a rapport, AKA just make a friend guys. It's so simple. Um, and then get the pictures because then in a month or two or in four to six on average, like I said, when they do have that bad day or whatever happens and that level of motivation increases to where they're willing to trade at a discount, you guys heard me say that a couple times today, for convenience, um, then boom, we might already have those pictures. So there's a fine line between do I go now and get those pictures and try to make a friend or is it just going to be a complete waste of time, right? So, you know, that's kind of hard to determine, but, you know, we, 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 can kind of, we can kind of figure it out a little bit by just saying something very simple like this, guys. This is so incredibly simple. Steal it. I hope you do. Use your own name. Hi, I'm Dave. I'm an investor. I buy houses cash, quick as is, but I don't pay retail, right? So if you are willing to, you know, give me a slight discount, you don't have to say massive, but a slight discount, I can make your life incredibly easy. I'll buy cash. You don't have to clean it as is. We'll close quick, relatively, two, three, maybe four weeks not four months, right? And uh, you don't have to do any cleaning, any painting, any repairs. And if it's filled with shit and trash, keep it. I like those kind of houses. Is it filled up? Great. Oh, when can I see it? I mean, that's it. It's so incredibly simple. Solve problems, make friends. That's it. So the interesting, let's talk a little bit more about, about the appointment or not. And, and let me kind of start this out with a, a, just a quick little story in my career. When I first started out, uh, I had a homeowner lead come in and I did the normal filtering, the normal questions. And she had mentioned that her uh, spouse had passed away. And, but like she was stone cold poker face. There wasn't really any emotion in her voice. Uh, for whatever reason, it just didn't feel like she was that motivated. And I decided to go on the appointment anyway. So it was kind of, it wasn't one of those, but, but I decided, well, there could be pain there because of what happened with the spouse, right? I was like, I'm just going to go anyway. It doesn't seem like she, she wants that. And then the second I get there, uh, she breaks down into tears and is crying about like the loss of her loved one. Uh, and I, I didn't think ahead of time to even bring an offer. So like I had to then go back to my house, print out an offer, and then bring it back a second appointment the same day. And, and you know, we end up having a, a great deal. She just needed to be done with the property. Uh, so what do you do, Dodge, on... on um, on kind of those gray area ones and to go on the appointment or not. Um, like, like when do you, like, like, do you have any kind of rules in place or, or do you I got a couple things to say on, on that topic. So number one, put some, put a bunch of contracts in your trunk right now, everybody don't go back, just have them with you. Right. Just have some, some basic contracts. If you want to use special sale, that's fine. I hate special sale. 
it's way too long and people don't want to read through it. I use simple one and two page contracts, print off 50 to hundred, throw them in your trunk. You never know when you might need them. Right? So that's number one. Um, number two, um, we talked about this a second ago, Jim, you don't know when their level of motivation is going to peak on the phone call. It didn't sound like it did, but when you got there, the sentiment kicked in, she missed her husband, poor lady, right? Uh, the motivation skyrocketed. So when do we determine when we want to make an appointment? Again, I think it falls back to best for you and your business, right? Is that a, a part of town that you are willing to go to get pictures because you hope the level of motivation gets higher sooner than later? Well, yeah, run those appointments. If it's in a place that you don't buy, right? And you don't care, that's not best, right? So when I say keep the best, sell the rest, same with appointments. Good part of town, I'm going to go. I don't care if they're not even that motivated today because in six, eight, 10 months, maybe they will be, I'll already have my pictures. Maybe I'll even have a contract that I'll give them that they laugh at. But in six or eight months, all of a sudden that looks like, you know, they need the convenience all of a sudden, right? So a um, couple things there, and I don't want to get off on too many topics, but A, put contracts in your car. B, best for you and your business, right? If the level of motivation is high, doesn't really matter where they're at, go. If it's not that high, well, then start looking at the market, start looking at what you're looking for and start looking at, you know, do you like that part of town? Is it going to be worth your time? Or are you willing to waste time on an appointment in Kirkwood? I would be, yes, versus, uh, you know, Castle Point. Like I'm buying a Castle Point. If you guys got anything up there, I'm only going to give you $200 to maybe $1,500 bucks. But the, but the cash is green, right? I'm not going to go look at those houses. Probably even if I buy them, I'm just going to, you know, just going to look on the map or maybe send someone up to drive by. But if it's in Kirkwood and I live in De Pere, so it's like a three minute ride for me, I'm going to go, right? Just because it's right in my wheelhouse of what I'm looking for, right? So best isn't necessarily defined by highest and best of the property itself. It's more about your goals and your business, right? A lot of people have uh, these big goals, but they have no plan, which really just means they have a lot of dreams. So, you know, what are your goals? Well, mine are, mine are very simple, you know, wholesale, because it's a means to an end and I enjoy it, right? And I'm going to buy the best and I'm going to sell the rest. And my passion is building a huge portfolio of rentals. So my goal is build portfolio of rentals via wholesale marketing. And we'll do a couple flips in there as well because they're fun, right? But I know every day when I wake up that wholesaling is a job, right? So the faster that I can build my portfolio of rentals, the better. And how better way to do it than generating my own leads direct to the seller. And we keep the best. And again, best is, you know, I don't know the right way to, to phrase this, but it's, it's relative to you, so, you so only, let me, right? Let me add to this. Can I add to this really quick? So, Please. Um, so there's Ryan and I, a, a few months ago, got into like a little bit of like a, like a, you guys uh, put the gloves on? Discussion. It wasn't an argument. It was a discussion. And it was <laughs> like, okay, well, what's most important? Like uh, knowing your numbers and the criteria of your buys over lead generating. And if you think about it, guys, like I can go, I can literally, any of you can go get a hundred leads within 20 minutes by calling, randomly calling a realtor and saying, Hey, set me up for a search on the MLS and you can get a hundred leads at a search that takes them five minutes to get you. If you don't have what the best criteria is for your business and are crystal clear on what that is, it, those hundred leads really don't mean anything. Like you have no way to filter. So, so in my mind, it's, it's defining what is the best buy, the best criteria for yourself first, and then getting those most amount of leads that you possibly can. So then you can filter in and get those buys on that criteria. Um, uh, so, so when I, so when he says kind of buy the best, the thing about it is, is like Dodge is crystal clear on what the best means for him. So like uh, your Burr pro let's talk about this really quick. So your Burr properties, your rentals, what's the exact criteria that you guys have identified uh, for a for a property that you like for your partner. So I got to shout out my business partner, Mike Slane again. He just put together a free course um, and I'm not here to pitch you guys on it, but you should check it out. It's really awesome. Um, and our rental metrics calculator Excel sheet is in it and uh, it's freelandlordcourse.com. So go there, check it out, but I will explain it as well. So we look for 20,000 in equity. We look for properties that we can burr our way out of and be in them for zero. 
Uh, we've done about 50 over the last, uh, I don't know, 14, 15 months, give or take. And our average amount of money left in those deals is 1200 bucks. And the only reason that it's, that it's positive and not negative, which would mean we'd actually have none of our own money in it, is because in the beginning, we weren't that good at it and we've gotten better and better as we go, right? So we started leaving in the beginning, you know, four, six, eight, ten 10 in the deal. And then we've kind of got ourselves down to, you know, zero. And recently, we've even done deals where we've been able to pay back our lender um, for both purchase and rehab and walk with two, three, four grand after the refi. Um, I forgot what your question was. What was the question? Uh, so, no, you, you actually answered the first two components of it. Uh, so you're looking for 20 k oh, oh, the, uh, the metrics. Yeah, yeah. So we want 20 grand. We want tw yeah, yeah. We want 20 grand worth of equity. We want to have at least 250 in cash flow. Now that's not necessarily per unit. That's just, it's, uh, that's for a single family. It gets a little bit more complicated when it's multi, but for a single family, we want 250 in cash flow. Okay. And then location, um, like, are you crystal clear on location? Like, where do you go location wise? Nope. doesn't matter about the location. We, we don't, we do not buy over 1%. We sh really shoot for more like 1.2 to 1.3%. And that's more of a return on investment type of thing, guys. The 1% rule, if you aren't familiar, you want your, you want your monthly income on the property, gross income to be 1% of the purchase price plus the repair or 1% of your all in cost. So if you buy a property for 80, you put 20 in it, you're really into it for a hundred K. You want that property to, to rent for at least a thousand bucks. That's 1%. So we do not buy anything that we rent that is over the 1% rule. Some of our properties are even closer to the 2% rule. Well, essentially that's a property that you're all in for 40 grand and it rents for 800. Again, our average is 1.2 to 1.3, 1.35, somewhere in that range. Uh, North County, South City, anywhere that works. That does not work in Clayton. That does not work in Kirkwood, typically. It does not work in Chesterfield, typically. Not always, typically. So, of course, we're going to have a lot of rental properties in Florissant, Hazelwood, Ferguson, as well as not so much Dutchtown, but like, you know, South City, um, where you can get properties um, at a steep discount, add value to them. Um, and refi out. So 250 minimum cash flow, 20 grand minimum um, equity. And then we like to leave, you know, less than let's say two grand in the deal. So the spreadsheet that we have, um, it's an, I don't know if it's, it's actually not an Excel. It's a Google drive or Google sheets, but the way Mike has it set up is you, when you go to view it, you can copy it into your own drive and then boom, you have your own copy of it. It's really, really cool. But one of my favorite things about it is there's only four things that you can really input there's there's a, there's like three different types of, it's all color coordinated right so the first boxes are are and there's a legend but they're they're empty and you fill in your numbers the next couple boxes are kind of a light gray and you can tweak those but typically once you get those set and that's just criteria that your lender is going to give you you know is it a 20-year loan what's the interest rate you know, so on and so forth. What's the percentage of loan to value that you're going to get? So you can adjust those if needed, but typically once you put them in, they're fixed. And I think they're defaulted to what we use. And then the last but not least is your output. And Mike has this really, really great system of color coordinating shit. So it's like if it, it's green, yellow, or red. So I put in my numbers. I don't even read the, the output. Is it all green? Boom. So basically the way he has it set up is it's above my head, but if it's at or above our minimums, it's green. If it's not and it's close, it's yellow or orange. And if it doesn't have uh, 20 grand in equity, at least 250 a month in cash flow in a burr strategy that will allow us to cash out for basically less than two grand, then those won't be all green. So when we import a property in there and it's all green, we buy it, all right? We remove the emotion from the game is this a numbers game? We look at the high and the low side of both the comps, right? But if the numbers make sense, we buy it. So the only mistake we could have is that we overestimate our ARV or we underestimate our, rep our repairs. That's really it, right? And those happen. We're not perfect, but the more and more times that we do it, the better we get. And again, that's kind of why um, we're getting better at this. As I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we use the burst strategy. We've done about 50 of them, give or take. And our average is about 1200. So the next 50, hopefully the average will be negative 1200 and we'll be at $0 in 100 houses, right? And we'll essentially have, you know, zeroed out the average of what we've left in these. That's kind of the goal. Okay, so we have uh, just a few more minutes left. And uh, if you all have questions for Dave, 
I think I have one more topic that I really want to hammer on with him while we have him. Uh, I don't, Dave, if you have to run at 11, you have to No, run. no, I'm good. I got all kinds of time. Um, uh, if some of these members that are on the call, if you guys have some questions, maybe we can go a little bit over the normal 11 on. Uh, yeah, on. I got all kinds of time. Uh, so if you guys have any questions or start thinking of questions, we'll do it. But, but one final thing that I'd like to get with you, okay? So now you're at the appointment and you're negotiating the deal. Um, what is just a quick high level uh, view of your pro your sales process when you're negotiating appointments uh, with the homeowner? Yeah, so guys, I, I'm not a sales guru. I haven't bought a bunch of sales courses. Um, I'm not a high level of intensity type of a salesperson. Um, my whole my kind of approach is I can offer you convenience if you can, if you're willing to kind of part with some of the equity there, right? Like if you can give me a discount and if you are great, let's do it. Let's try to work this out. Um, otherwise, like, I don't know if I can really help you. Right. So like, I don't really have a bunch of negotiating tactics up my sleeve. Um, I do love using silence. You know, I'll make an offer. I don't, I don't have a problem with, you know, awkward silence. I think that helps a lot, but we're kind of firm with our offers. You know, if somebody says, okay, well, we're going to shop it, go for it. If you can find a better offer, listen, yeah, it's going to be less, bit, less, less money that my business is going to generate, but I truly want the best for these individuals out there. Right. Um, so if you can get somebody that's going to pay you more, please go find that person. I'm not going to help you find them, but if you do great, Otherwise, here's kind of where my offer's at. Um, you know, when I say that we're really firm with our offers, meaning that you know, we, we will negotiate up, like whenever we determine our MAOs, we don't offer MAO, we always offer a little less, but we're not really willing to come up all that much. So basically whenever you know, me and my team internally say, hey, meet them in the middle, that means this. I gotta look and make sure I'm in the right camera. Here's where my offer's at. Here's where they want me to be right? When we meet them in the middle, I'm going to come up about 10%, maybe 15, and they're going to come down 85. That's, that's meeting in the middle, in my opinion. All right. So yeah, nobody wants to negotiate with somebody that's like ultra firm. So we do pad in some negotiation numbers, but typically not a lot. And we just, we justify our offers uh, with a credibility packet. So we'll send them a proof of funds. Um, we will send them uh, information about the title company. We'll send them either a purchase and sale contract or an option agreement. Uh, we'll have our closing coordinator reach out to them, even if they hadn't signed, just to let them know, hey, this business is serious. I need to either you know, make up my mind or, or let them know that I'm not going to sign, um, and so on and so forth. So there's definitely no high-pressure sales tactics. There's definitely... Um, Are you doing the offers in person? No secrets. It, doing... uh, it doesn't matter. In person, over the phone. You know, I mean, again, we're very transparent. So we'll also come in and we'll just say, listen, here's what we think it's worth um, fixed up, but it's not fixed up. So, you know, in order for us to, let's just use some simple math, guys. ARV is 100K. It needs 20 grand worth of repairs, right? They're going to say, well, well, I should give it to you for 75, right? You put in 20 and you make yourself five grand. It's like, no, I'm going to lose five because I have agent commissions, holding costs, closings, taxes, all these things. It needs to be lower than that. And it's only worth 100 after I put that 20 in. So it's not worth 80. It's not worth 75. It's barely worth 70. I'd be really more comfortable at 60 to 65 grand. Again, it's not going to be worth 100, that ARV, until you do a new kitchen, new roof, and floors, period, right? So we're, we're overly transparent about how we come up with our math. Um, and then a lot of times whenever we're doing our MAO formula over the phone or in person, they say, well, 70%, you know, you're multiplying my property by 70%. That's 30% profit. Wrong. That's, that's, that's 12 to 15% profit. The other 15% helps pad closing costs, uh, commissions with agents. Seller concessions is huge, right? At the last minute, um, when you go to sell it, you're going to have to do repairs. So that's a cost. Uh, private lender interest or interest yeah, in general. Yeah, I mean, all these things uh, add up and they typically add up to about 15% of what you bought it for or of the ARVs amount. So whenever we say, hey, you know, sometimes, sometimes I won't multiply a property by 70%. Instead, I'll do it twice. I'll say, all right, 15% for holding cost and 15% for profit because it helps them understand, hey, I'm not trying to make 30%, but I am trying to make 15. Again, we talked about this earlier, Jim. 
I'm in business and the definition of business is the act of making money. And what I do is I offer convenience for a discount. So if you don't want to offer me the discount, no problem. We'll call you back in two weeks or in two months, right? But if I'm going to come out of you know, my shell and, 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 and offer this massive amount of convenience to you, then you have to give me a discount. That's just the way it works. Yeah, so, and then it's really just building rapport and, and trust. And, and so when, like, like if I was a homeowner, I was just, as he was talking, I was thinking to myself, okay, if I'm a homeowner listening to Dave talk, I would trust this guy 100% because of how, you know, he's just being completely transparent and honest. He's not like trying to like hide. No, and I tell people, hey, oh. I'm not buying this house to move in it. I'm going to buy it to do one of three things. One, I'm going to fix it up and rent it and put a nice family in there. I always say that because it sounds so nice. Two, I'm going to fix it up and I'm going to sell it retail to a nice family. Again, it sounds nice. Or three, I'm going to flip it for a couple thousand dollar profit. But at the end of the day, why does any of that matter to you? You just want to sell it. And guess what? I want to buy it, right? So I tell them on the exit or my exit before I even offered you know, typically offer a number. I say, this is what my plans are. If you want to fix it up and flip it, great. L let me know how I can give you pointers. But typically they don't have money to do it or they don't want to do it. That's why they're calling us, right? Yeah. So I'm, I just take the transparency approach. Like I just love that approach. It eliminates people getting mad whenever we are wholesaling and a buyer falls out because I'll tell them, hey, I bought 90-ish houses last year. There's no possible way that one human, unless they won the lottery or they're just a genius, could do this on their, on their own. We have a lot of partners and most of those partners are you know, equity partners or private lending partners. And if they back out for whatever reason, it's not me that backed out, it's my partner. So let me have some more time to go find a new partner, right? If you, if you explain that to them in the beginning when that does happen, and it doesn't happen often, maybe one in 20, one in 30, um, it, it eliminates an argument or them backing out of your agreement at the last minute, right? So I just had a coaching call with one of my students this morning and he said, Dave, you know, do you try to collect uh, non-refundable earnest money on the B2C agreements, like on your assignments or on your double close sale agreements for wholesaling? And I said, absolutely, but it doesn't have to be a ton. I'm not asking for 2,500. You know, typically I want 500 to $1,000 unless the person's reputable, like anybody on this call here. But if I don't know them or they're a new buyer, I want to see that 500 to $1,000 non-refundable. Not because that's money going to me, but what happens is when they back out and that money's non-refundable, I take it and I give it to the seller. Hey, I told you from the get-go that I had partners. One of them kind of just screwed me. They screwed us. But guess what? I got 500 bucks or 1,000 bucks out of them. It's not mine. It's yours. It's going to go help pay the mortgage for another month. I need some more time. And whenever you go in with the transparency, people want to work with you. They are appreciative that you are shooting them straight. Like, I don't like to bullshit people. I want to shoot them straight. You know, and I just say, listen, this happens from time to time. I'm not going away. I'm going to go find a new partner. I got hundreds of them, right? But in this scenario right now, this might suck because I need another week or two. But guess what? I'm going to help cover some expenses. So the non-refundable earnest money isn't money that I keep. It's basically money that secures my relationship with a seller, right? And you probably haven't heard people talk about it like this, but it's a very, very good strategy to use when wholesaling because it eliminates deals from dying. I hate when deals die. I hate it because we spent so much time, money, effort, communication, you name it, getting to the finish line. So if you get there, do everything in your power to cross it. Don't just give up. Well, that's fascinating. So you're taking the, the earnest money that the, so that the end buyer, the cash buyer that back out on you, you're taking that and you're giving it over to the home. I've never kept it, ever. It, it's, it's, not, it's not my security. It's, the, it's security to close that deal. So again, put yourself in the shoes of a seller. I have your property under contract. We're going to close next Tuesday. Uh, Friday night, my buyer calls me and says, hey, something hit the fan. Maybe, maybe bullshit, maybe it's for real, whatever. Okay, well, I got to call that seller now and say, we're not closing Tuesday. Well, that's a shitty phone call to make unless you got some money to give them. Hey, this isn't going towards the purchase price. This is because my partner screwed up, but he vested money in the deal. So guess what? I'm going to give it to you. Sorry, can I get another two weeks? Well, shit, you're going to give me $500? It doesn't come off the sale price? 
Hell yeah. I don't lose deals because I had that in from the beginning, right? So, I mean, I, I, you guys should take that advice. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Hopefully you won't need it, but you know, Jim, what is it? One in 20, one in 30 deals. I mean, it shit happens. They fall apart. Um, you know, and, and that just, it just helps pad it, right? It just helps uh, the retention. So is there anything else on the B to C that we haven't, I mean, we really talked more about. So, so it's interesting, our focus guys, our focus really on the lead generation and getting the houses under contract. Cause like on wholesaling, that's really the name of the game. The, the, the B2C is actually easier. Cause if you have a good deal, uh, getting the end buyer is, is. You don't even need a buyer's list if you have a good deal. You got this little thing in your pocket called a cell phone. That's millions and millions of dollars with the technology that connects you to this little thing called Facebook. And on there, there's groups and there's a marketplace and you can sell yeah. all of your deals there. If keyword, they are good. And you bought them at a discount. Having a buyer's list is awesome. You don't need it. Yeah. So, um, so is there anything else on the B to C, uh, that we haven't gone over that you do? Not really. You know, I mean, we, we stay in contact with them. We do have a closing coordinator that, you know, touches base with them, uh, right. Whenever we get a contract signed and then, maybe a couple days prior to closing and then on closing. Um, and we make it easy, man. We provide a level of convenience. If they don't want, if they can't move, but they need money to move, you know, we'll, we'll front it to them and take it off at closing. We'll rent houses back to people. Um, we will buy houses filled with trash. We just did one in South city. They had six dumpsters that came out of it. Um, we found a bunch of random shit in there. We found some treasure. We found some cash and some coins and, uh, some valuable stuff in there, which was kind of fun. Do that from time to time. But yeah, I mean, really, it's, it's you know, when would you like to close? Oh, you need two months? No problem. Like, we, we, in order for me to justify buying a property at a discount, I feel that, I, that there is a need for me to offer them a high level of convenience. And that level of convenience could be different. Again, we talked about the best, you know, right? Being best for you. Well, same for them. That convenience is what do they need? Is it that they need to close quick? Maybe they don't need to close quick. Maybe they have three months and they close any time, but their level of convenience is that they don't want to go there because a loved one died there or they inherited it or they live out of state or whatever it is. It's, it's always going to be something different, but just provide convenience to what they need and you're going to create a win-win scenario almost every time. Well, I, hey, I really appreciate your time on this. Let's, uh, uh, let's open it up for kind of like a live. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Anybody has any questions? I'm here. I'm an open book, guys.